Hi everyone, my name is FlygonHG, and this is the video of my attempt at a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Diamond using only Fire-type Pokemon. To see what I define as hardcore Nuzlocke rules, check out the description below. But in short, no items in battle, no overleveling past the Gym Leader's Ace, and we're playing on set mode. So it's finally here. The much requested, incredibly difficult, meme run of a Sinnoh Fire-type only run. Now, for those of you who have never played a Sinnoh game before, let's break down why this monologue is so ridiculously difficult. While fire types are pretty rare in most games, the Sinnoh Pokedex takes this to the extreme, resulting in a grand total of just six fire type Pokemon before the Elite Four. That means that, wait, this, this is the set of encounters for Platinum, and we're doing this challenge on Diamond. So we lose a few encounters, let me just get rid of those, and here we are. Yeah. The Fire-type encounters in Pokemon Diamond are this monkey and this skinny cow. That's it. Two encounters for the entire game. Fortunately, both Infernape and Rapidash are fast Pokemon, but I'm gonna level with you. This challenge was incredibly difficult. For the sake of time, I won't be touching on every single thing that I had to consider when dealing with this challenge, chief among them being experience management so that I didn't overlevel. But if you are interested, seek out the full videos of the entire playthrough on Twitch where I meticulously break down every issue that comes up. Also, we now have a Discord channel. Find the link in the description to join the Flygon community. You can discuss nuzlocking, make recommendations for future challenges, and more. Anyways, I plugged my Twitch, I plugged my Discord. Is there anything else that I want to plug here? Right, this video's sponsor. This video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Surfshark VPN is a virtual private network that creates a protected virtual connection when you are connected to the internet. This encrypts your internet traffic to keep your information safe and gives you privacy from potentially dangerous public connections. Plus, Surfshark VPN bypasses geo-blocking, meaning that you can access sites and content from across the world. Did you know that Academy Award winner Shrek is on Netflix in the UK? Well, with Surfshark VPN, you can access Shrek via UK Netflix from anywhere in the world. That alone is pretty priceless value. But there's plenty of VPNs, so why Surfshark? Well, for one, you can get 83% off by using the link in the description and the code FLYGONHG. That's a huge discount, and it gives you Surfshark VPN for about two bucks a month, one dollar for every encounter in this challenge run. Plus, you get three months free. But in addition to a great discount, there's plenty of other reasons to use Surfshark. It's incredibly easy to use and set up, they provide around-the-clock support, and with a single subscription, you can use Surfshark VPN on all your devices. And lastly, perhaps the number one reason to use Surfshark VPN is that sharks are cool. Did you know that 83% of children who become fascinated by an aquatic animal become fascinated by sharks? Did you know that 50% of weather-obsessed crime bosses prefer sharks over camels? Children and Team Aqua approve. So try it out by using the link in the description and the promo code FLYGONHG for 83% off safe, secure, shark-based web browsing and streaming. Thanks so much to Surfshark VPN for sponsoring this video. So now, let's get into it. Just as a quick reminder, before we start, I play with Species Claws, so I'll be able to reroll encounters until I get a unique encounter, but I can only use one of each unique evolution line. So, I won't be using 5 Rapidash. Okay, let's see how it goes. As you may have guessed, I start the challenge by picking Chimchar as my starter. I named Chimchar Monkey, and our journey begins. We can't get Ponyta until we get to Eterna City, so our next stop is the first gym leader. But first, we're challenged by our rival, Rival. Our rival can be kind of difficult since he chose a Piplup, but in this first fight, the Piplup never uses Bubble, so it's pretty easy. After taking out the Starly, we just trade off Scratches and Pounds until we're victorious. Just kidding, we lose because Piplup gets a critical hit Pound. That was fun. Okay, so we take another crack at Rival Rival in Attempt 2, and things go better. Starly goes down to two Embers, and then Piplup goes down to a handful of Scratches and Embers, thanks to Blaze activating at the end. With that, we can move on to Rourke. Now, Rourke can be very difficult to deal with. Fortunately, the level cap for Rourke is 14, and for whatever reason, Monkey can evolve into Monferno at level 14. So this gives him access to Mach Punch, which gives him a Fighting-type stab move to hit Rourke's Rock types with. However, there's actually an even easier play here. In Diamond and Pearl, you can get the TM for Hidden Power from the Trainer School in Jubilife, which is a special move with a random type and random power based on your Pokémon's IVs, or their individual values. We'll talk about IVs more later, but for now, just know that it means that Monkey has a Hidden Power Water type with around 50 base power. 
And since Rourke's Pokémon are very weak to special moves, and since both Geodude and Onix are times 4 weak to water, Monkey is able to sweep through Rourke's entire team without much of a problem. And that's badge number 1. Before heading to the second gym, we need to face Commander Mars from Team Galactic. Definitely not Team Plasma, I know the difference. There's a bunch of Commander fights throughout this game, and I'm only going to touch on the ones that are notably difficult going forward. Despite Mars's hideously disfigured cat, this one isn't one of the ones that's particularly difficult, since Mach Punch makes relatively quick work of it. And after that, we get to Eterna City, so we can now catch our second and final team member, a Ponyta from Route 211. I name her Cow, and with our ultra-powerful tag team, we can take care of Gardenia no problem. And by tag team, I mean flame wheels from Monkey sweep through Gardenia's entire team as Cow cheers from the sidelines. After the battle, Gardenia gives us the TM for Grass Knot, which will be incredibly valuable later on. Before continuing with the gym campaign though, we need to fight Commander Jupiter. She has a Skun tank, and that's a little scary, but we'll be fine. Cow knocks out the Zubat with two stomps, and then the Skun tank comes out, and I use a Tail Whip to lower its defense. I also use a Growl to lower the Skun tank's attack before switching into Monkey and taking it out. Just kidding! Skunk Tank gets a critical hit Night Slash, bypassing the stat drops, and killing Cow. Monkey is able to come in and take care of the Skun Tank, but it's way too early in the run to lose Cow, so I think it's time for a reset. Somewhere around this point is when I start debating whether it's actually worth it to keep using Species Claws. If I was playing without the Species Claws, I could catch 5 different Ponyta, which would give me some wiggle room and some sacrificial lambs. Or sacrificial cows, I guess. It'd be kind of embarrassing if I messed up farm animals like that. Anyways, at least for now, I decide to keep trying with Species Claws active, but maybe we'll reassess this if this becomes impossible. Attempt 3 starts off pretty much the same way. My hidden power type is fighting this time around, so Rourke is a pretty easy sweep. We catch a new cow, this time he's male, and then after burning Gardenia's place of work down to the ground, it's Jupiter round 2. This time I decide to lead with Monkey. I thought a Flame Wheel would one-shot the Zubat, but it doesn't. I get lucky though, and Zubat gets burned, meaning that the wing attack that she uses doesn't do much damage. The Skun Tank is out next, and despite some accuracy drops from Smokescreen, we get lucky and none of Monkey's Flame Wheels miss. I switch to Cow at the very end, and a Stomp takes out the Skun Tank, winning us the battle. Now that that's over, we're facing an incredibly difficult part of this challenge. In Diamond and Pearl, the 3rd and 4th Gym Leaders are Maylene in Veilstone City and Crasher Wake in Pastoria City, respectively. Both Maylene and Crasher Wake have level caps of 30, which means that I need to beat both of these Gym Leaders without going over the level cap. This means that for one of these Gyms, I'll need to be under level. Now fortunately, you can access both Veilstone City and Pastoria City at any time and in any order. This means that I can go to both gyms and clear through all the mandatory trainers along the way so that I can essentially take on Maylene and Crasher Wake back to back. And this is pretty necessary, because Maylene has a Machoke and a Lucario that we will definitely need to one-shot, and Crasher Wake has all water types, including a Gyarados, so this is going to take a great deal of preparation. But we have a few resources at our disposal. The first is that I get access to the Underground. This is important for a few reasons. One, it gives me access to a bunch of cool items, like a Heat Rock, which will extend the length of Sun from Sunny Day, which is a TM that I pick up and teach to Cow. The Underground also gives me access to virtually unlimited money. By mining for items, and with enough patience, I'm able to sell items I find in the Underground for money without having to challenge trainers over and over again. This means that unlimited money is not tied to experience points. It just requires a lot of patience. With unlimited money, I'm also able to purchase unlimited coins at the Veilstone Game Corner where I can pick up incredibly useful TMs like Sword Stance and Flamethrower. I'm also able to purchase TMs like Solar Beam and Natural Gift from the Veilstone Department Store, as well as stat-boosting items like Proteins and Irons. All of this gives us at least a fighting chance against Maylene and Crasher Wake. But there's one more important resource to tap. In Sinnoh, there are two people who give you berries once a day. First is the Berry Master on Route 208 who will randomly give you one of the berries numbered 1 to 30. This includes the common berries like the citrus berry, cherry berry, orange berry. It also includes the stat-lowering berries like the palm egg berry, and then a handful of random other berries like the wepper berry that is primarily used to make poffins. Second, a woman in Pastoria City will randomly give you one of these super effective resist berries. So for example, a pasho berry will reduce the damage of a super effective water type attack by half. So by changing the date on my computer, I I mean, my Nintendo DS. 
I can theoretically get an unlimited supply of these berries, as long as I have enough patience to do so. But I don't have patience. That's why I'm on YouTube. In the interest of making videos at a relatively consistent rate, and not having my Twitch streams just be hours of this, I decide to take matters into my own hands and speed up the process through the use of PK Hex. But as a reminder, I'm only doing this to get items that are legally capable of being farmed at this point in the game anyways. The only thing that this is doing is cutting away hours and hours of grinding to make for more entertaining content. My conscience is clear, so hopefully you can live with this too. If not, let me know in the comments. You know, YouTube algorithms and such. Anyways, let's get back to the actual gameplay, shall we? After clearing through all the trainers, we take on Maylene. First up is a Metatite. I lead Monkey, who sets up a sword stance as Metatite uses a drain punch. Unfortunately, I need another sword stance here to guarantee a kill on the Machoke in the back, so I have to risk a crit. But I'm unpunished as Metatite just goes for a Meditate. A Flame Wheel kills the Metatite, and then Lucario comes out. But thanks to its steel typing, a Flame Wheel is enough for a one shot, as we just outspeed it thanks to some speed EVs. Last is Machoke. But Monkey is holding a Koba Berry, which halves damage from a super effective flying move. But more importantly, it means that we can use Natural Gift. Natural Gift is a physical move that changes type and base power based on the berry that the user is holding. With a Koba Berry, this gives us a one-time 60 base power flying type move that is able to knock out the Machoke in one shot. That's Maylene defeated. Immediately after that, we make our way to Pastoria City and take on Crasher Wake. Crasher Wake is an absolute beast, thanks to his Gyarados, which will lower my attack at the start of the battle with Intimidate. So even a Natural Gift Electric-type move won't kill the Gyarados with minus one attack. There's also the Float Cell in the back that we need to outspeed and take out quickly, so we'll need to be pretty creative, and unfortunately, we will need to dodge a crit or two. I lead Cow into the Gyarados to eat the Intimidate. I then use Natural Gift, which is based off of a Wepper Berry, which gives Cow a 70 base power Electric-type attack. This does decent damage into Gyarados, as it goes for a bite. As a note here, it makes zero sense for Gyarados to go for bite. Brine does more damage. So does Dragon Rage. The AI in Diamond and Pearl is really dumb, which is great because it means that the AI usually doesn't go for the optimal play. But the thing about dumb AI is that it's also unpredictable, which means that it's incredibly difficult to predict what it's going to do, making it impossible to plan around every single possibility. More on that later, though. On the next turn, I switch to Monkey, and unfortunately, Gyarados goes for a Super Potion here, which wasn't part of the plan. But it should be okay. I go for a Sword Stance as Gyarados goes for a Dragon Rage. I've made sure to EV Monkey so that he won't go down to two Dragon Rages, which always does 40 damage. I hit a Grass Knot for a chunk of damage as Gyarados goes for a Brine. This leaves Monkey with 3 HP. So obviously I was at a risk to a crit here, but there was nothing that I could really do about that. But now that I'm at low health, Blaze is active, and thanks to the plus two attack from Swords Dance, Flame Wheel takes out the Gyarados. Next up is Quagsire, but the Chunky Boy goes down to a single Grass Knot. And then third is Float Sill, but we have another Wepper Berry prepared for that, so a Natural Gift takes it out in one shot, winning us the fourth Gym Badge. With that massive obstacle out of the way, we get a little bit of a break in terms of difficulty. First off, our level cap jumps all the way up to level 36, so Monkey is able to evolve into Infernape. Which, by the way, is a really dumb name. Infernape is clearly not an ape. It's a monkey. It has a tail. Anyways, after that, it's time to take on Fantina. But compared to Crash or Wake, she should be a total breeze. Her Drifloom poses a slight problem because it likes to use Minimize, and its ability Aftermath does a sizable chunk of damage if I kill it with a move that makes contact. But Monkey should have enough power to be able to take care of it without too much trouble. So I start with a Swords Dance as Drifloom goes for a Minimize. I then go for a second sword stance as Driplim just uses Astonish, another example of the DP AI being absolute garbage. Next I go for a Flame Wheel, which misses, and then Driplim hits an Ominous Wind, and the 10% Omni Boost activates, giving it plus one to all of its stats. That's, that's really bad. Not the end of the run, but now I do need to play carefully and get lucky. So the first thing I have to do is hit a Flame Wheel, so I go for a Flame Wheel, Okay, okay, now it's over. Driftblim hits a gust, bringing Monkey into Blaze range. But thanks to the Omni Boost, a Flamethrower, even in Blaze, won't kill. And if I kill with Flame Wheel, Driftblim's Aftermath will kill me in return. My one play is to get a critical hit with Flamethrower. I managed to hit the Flamethrower, but it doesn't crit. So, 
monkey goes down. Cow is able to come out and take out the Drift Blim, but even if he can somehow beat the rest of Fantina's team, which he doesn't, this run is dead without monkey. That was terrible, terrible luck. I had a zoom lens to up my accuracy, but even then I managed to miss two attacks and the Drift Blim got that plus one Omni boost. Really unideal, but I know I can play that fight better. So let's take it from the top. In attempt four, Monkey has a really bad hidden power type. I wanna say it's poison type, but I don't actually remember. Either way, it means we have to use Mach Punch to get through Rourke, which is borderline impossible. Mach Punch doesn't even two-shot the Geodude and we take way too much damage from Rock Throw. I try to induce a burn with Ember, since it does similar damage anyways, but that doesn't end up working. We are able to take out the Geodude, and the Onyx is hot garbage, so it can't knock us out either, but Kranidos is able to finish the job. With a bit of luck, or a slightly stronger Monferno I guess, this is technically possible, but this is an important thing to keep in mind when evaluating whether a specific challenge run is actually possible or not. Sometimes the first gym leader is a complete brick wall to what seems like an otherwise really exciting challenge. Rourke is especially difficult because he has two physical walls and a hard-hitting ace, so if you can't get access to a special move before level 14, you're usually pretty screwed. This is particularly problematic in Platinum, where hidden power has been removed from the trainer school in Jubilife City, so it actually prevents a surprising amount of challenges without just insane amounts of luck or some rule change for the first gym. Anyways, on the very next attempt, Monkey gets hidden power fighting again, so it's all good. We're able to sweep through Rourke on attempt 5 and then move on with our lives. We also, of course, catch Cow, and then we plow through Gardenia's grass types. However, because of new Monkey and new Cow's different IVs, EVs, nature, etc, etc, their stats are a little different, and so the plan that I had for Maylene and Crasher Wake in attempt 3 won't work here. So here's what I worked out instead. I lead Cow into Maylene's Metatite and set up a sunny day, as she goes for a drain punch. Then I switch to Monkey, who gets hit by a confusion. Even if that confusion crit, we would be fine, and Monkey is also holding a person berry in case of confusion. From here, three flamethrowers boosted by Sun knock out Maylene's entire team. Barring Meditate using Meditate and then getting a critical hit drain punch, that plan was foolproof. The plan for Wake is a little less foolproof. Unfortunately, Monkey doesn't have a high enough attack stat this time to be able to reliably knock out Floatzel even after a sword stance, so I have to bet on Cal. I lead Monkey into Crasher Wake's Gyarados to eat up the attack drop from Intimidate. Monkey also has an Iron Ball equipped, which quarters his speed. This allows Monkey to use U-Turn after Gyarados has attacked to switch into Cow without Cow taking any damage. This is a bit dangerous because it risks a critical hit Brine, a flinch from Bite, or Swagger. But thankfully we pull it off and Cow comes in with neutral stats. Next, I need to set up a Sunny Day, which puts us at risk to a Swagger, but Gyarados just goes for a Bite again. Then, a Weperberry boosted Natural Gift kills the Gyarados, which gets us another level and enough speed points to outspeed the Floatzel. Quagsire comes out second and goes down to a Solar Beam, which is now a single turn move because of the Sun. And last is Floatzel, who goes down to a single Solar Beam as well. Did I just sweep through Crasher Wake's Water-type gym with a Ponyta? Yes. Yes, I did. Next up is round two against Fantina. I've revised the strategy to make it a little more to our advantage, but it's still not flawless. I start with Swords Dance and Drift Blim goes for the Ominous Wind. There's half a second of absolute fear that it'll get another Omni Boost, but thankfully it doesn't. I go for another Swords Dance and Gust hits hard, but a Citrus Berry heals enough health that I'm not in range of Aftermath, so a Flame Wheel takes out the Drift Blim. The Mismagius and the Gengar in the back also go down to two Flame Wheels, winning us the fifth gym badge and getting us our furthest attempt yet. Ultimately though, this still wasn't the best game plan because a lot of things still could have gone wrong. We had Aerial Ace to play around Minimize, which would have killed after two sword stances, but a critical hit from Gust or a boost from Ominous Wind would have definitely ended the run again. The unreliability of AI is a really big pain. Anyways, our next stop is Canalave City to fight Rourke's dad, Byron. We do get stopped by our rival rival here, and I know I've been skipping all the rival fights, but it's because he's really underwhelming in Diamond and Pearl. For example, during this specific fight in Platinum, he has a Staraptor, but here, it's just a Staravia. Rival Rival also consistently makes really terrible move choices, so he's never much of a problem. Even in the final battle against Rival Rival before the Elite Four, his Staraptor doesn't know Brave Bird and Diamond and Pearl, so it's super easy. We're just gonna ignore these battles from here on out. As I was saying, Byron. This should be super easy, because Byron has Steel types. However, because we had to get rid of close combat for the fight with Fantina, we don't actually have it here, 
since Infernape doesn't actually learn close combat until level 41. This isn't a problem against the Bronze Orb, since it goes down to a flamethrower, but it does mean that we need to rely on hidden power fighting for the Bastiodon, which isn't enough for a one-shot. But Bastiodon just retaliates with an ancient power, which even if it got the Omni Boost and it crit, it wouldn't matter. Last is Celix, and it goes down to a flamethrower too, getting us an easy 6th gym badge. With our new level cap at 42, Cow is finally now able to evolve into his beautiful final form, a Rapidash. With that, we have our final Elite Four team. But can we even get there? There's a bunch of Team Galactic stuff that we have to do here now, but we can skip it since it's all really easy. We eventually get to Snowpoint City, where it's time to take on Candace and her Ice types. Naturally, this is pretty easy, with flamethrowers just ripping through her first three Pokémon. Metacham is fourth, and actually holds on from a flamethrower, and retaliates with a Force Palm that actually would have killed me if it crit. So, that was pretty reckless, and I should have been planning around that. I lucked out. There's a lot of ways that I definitely could have played that battle safer, but I didn't really think too hard about it because I was so preoccupied by what comes next, which is easily the biggest challenge of the run so far. But before we break that down, I want to talk briefly about IVs, or individual values. In my previous videos, I've talked a bit about EVs, or effort values, which are points to stats that your Pokémon gain from defeating other Pokémon. So essentially, you have complete control over the EVs of your Pokémon. IVs, on the other hand, are individual values assigned to your Pokémon. Each Pokémon has an IV for each of the six stats, and each IV can range from 0 to 31. Pokémon with 31 IVs will have better stats than Pokémon with 0 IVs, assuming all else between the Pokémon is equal. So basically, certain Pokémon are just inherently better than others. When you catch a Pokémon, its IVs are generated at random, for the most part. And these IVs cannot be changed, at least not in Generation 4. So when I received Monkey, his IVs at the start stay the same throughout the rest of the playthrough. And these IVs, in addition to his nature and his EVs of course, determine the stats that he'll have at any given level, which in turn determines how much damage he does to other Pokémon and how much damage he receives from other attacks. So what are Monkey's IVs? Well, in-game it's pretty much impossible to tell what your Pokémon's IVs are. If you monitor your EVs, you can use online IV calculators to get a good estimate based on the stats at any given level, but we can actually just check the exact IVs and EVs of any Pokémon using PK Hex. The results? Not great. While Monkey does have a 30 special attack IV, which is great, and his defenses are average to good, his three remaining stats are pretty piss poor. Most notably, and most importantly, he has an attack IV of 2 which is really, truly terrible. Now for the most part, even during challenge runs, mediocre IVs aren't a huge deal. It's really only in fringe cases where this actually makes a significant difference, so generally you don't really need to worry too much about IVs during a Nuzlocke. But in a run where there's only two Pokémon to tackle every single problem that you face, fringe cases are a lot more common. And our next challenge just so happens to be one of those cases. Up next, we have to save the world by stopping Team Galactic at Spear Pillar. As is usually the case with world-ending conflicts, this is resolved with Pokémon battles, specifically two Pokémon battles back-to-back. -back. The first is a double battle against Galactic Commanders Mars and Jupiter, with Rival Rival as my partner. The battle isn't particularly difficult on the surface, but because Rival Rival leads with a Munchlax, he can oftentimes just be pretty much dead weight. On top of that, after beating Mars and Jupiter, you're immediately challenged by Cyrus. Rival Rival does heal your Pokémon, but it means that you can't switch up the order of your team, your held items, or your moveset. So everything used for the Mars and Jupiter fight has to also be optimized for the Cyrus fight, which is an incredibly specific and difficult challenge. Cyrus has four Pokémon, all of which can do a ton of damage to Monkey and Cow. Cow isn't strong enough to handle this fight on his own, and switching between Pokémon is too risky, so it's essentially up to Monkey to solo Cyrus. But there's a lot of problems. First, he leads with a Honchkrow that knows Drill Peck. A critical hit from that Honchkrow will instantly kill Monkey. There's nothing I can do about that, unless I hold a Koba Berry to reduce the damage from a super effective flying type move. He also has a Gyarados though, that knows Earthquake and Aqua Tail, which can one-shot Monkey. So we need to be able to kill the Gyarados in one shot. Unfortunately, as we already know, that's very difficult to do since Gyarados has Intimidate, which lowers our attack and the only reliable way to one-shot the Gyarados is with a natural gift Electric Berry. 
On top of that, there's also a Crobat, which can do a lot of damage with Cross Poison or Air Slash, and a Weavile, which can do a lot of damage with Brick Break. Plus, Crobat and Weavile are super fast, so we'll need a ton of speed investments to outspeed them. So how are we going to do this? Well, the plan is to set up a Sword Stance on Honchkrow. If the Honchkrow doesn't crit a Drill Pack, or Monkey is holding a Koba Berry, Monkey will be able to survive and have enough boosts to be able to one-shot the Gyarados and the Crobat with one specific move, Rock Slide. At plus one attack, Rock Slide will kill Gyarados and Crobat. But there is a catch. Rock Slide has 90% accuracy, which means if we miss Rock Slide on any of these Pokemon, they'll retaliate with a kill. There is one way around this though. By having Monkey hold a wide lens, we can increase the accuracy of Rock Slide to 99%, making it much more likely that we don't miss an attack. But there's another problem. Remember how I said that Monkey had an attack IV of 2? Well, because of that, and his neutral nature, even if we have max attack EVs, Monkey is not guaranteed to kill Gyarados or Crobat with Rock Slide. In Pokemon, there's a factor of randomness added to every damage calculation, such that any given attack has a range of damages that can be given. So while Rock Slide can kill these Pokemon, Monkey's attack IV is so bad that there are a few of these lower damage rolls that will actually leave both of those Pokemon with a sliver. So to avoid this, we actually need to give Monkey a Hard Stone, which will boost his Rock-type attacks, guaranteeing the kill on Gyarados and Crobat. If we hit. There's really nothing we can do about this. We can't cover all our bases, so we need to risk a crit from Drill Pack and risk several misses. This is easily the most stressed I've ever been for any battle in any challenge that I've done so far. But first, we need to beat Mars and Jupiter with Rival Rival. They start the battle with their two Bronzor. I've taught Monkey Flame Wheel so I can take out Commander Mars' Bronzor as Munchlax hits a Body Slam on the other. Perugly comes out next, so I target it to force a 2 on 1. And fortunately, Rival has the same idea because he hits Perugly with a Body Slam that paralyzes it. Good job, Rival! On the next turn, I decide to be a little greedy here and go for a Sword Stance. Perugly and Bronzor double up on Monkey as Rival just uses Stockpile. Right after I complimented you, Rival? Really? Anyways, on the next turn, I take out the Perugly with a Flame Wheel, and then Bronzor hits an Extra Sensory as Rival just uses Swallow. With that Extra Sensory damage, Monkey is looking pretty low, so I have to switch out to Cow. Then I go for a Protect to see if Rival will do some damage, but Munchlax goes down. So I set up a Sunny Day as Rival's Ponyta goes for a Will-O-Wisp. On the next turn, Flamethrower takes care of the Golbat, and Fire Blast from Ponyta takes care of the Bronzor. Mars and Jupiter are powerless against Cow and Baby Cow. Golbat is next, but a Flamethrower plus Burn damage takes it out, and then last is Skuntank. We hit it hard with Flamethrower, but it hangs on with the Sliver and retaliates with a Poison Job that actually would have killed if it crit. But luckily it didn't, so we win the battle with one more flamethrower. You know, Rival Rival was actually not completely useless. I'm proud of him. Now it's Cyrus time. I know what has to be done, and there's not much to do but pray that luck is on our side. Cyrus leads Honchcrow, and I go for Swords Dance. And then the idiot AI goes for a Dark Pulse, so I suppose that's nice. It means that it didn't see the crit with Drill Pack. Now unfortunately, because we needed Flame Wheel for the fight with Mars and Jupiter, we didn't have space for close combat, so I do need to risk a Rock Slide miss here. So I click Rock Slide, and it connects! One down, two to go. Gyarados comes out, and Rock Slide connects again. Next is Crobat, but even if we miss our Rock Slide here, it actually does need a critical hit with Air Slash or Cross Poison to knock us out. But we don't even miss! That is three for three Rock Slides, and after knocking out Weavile with a Flame Wheel, that Cyrus defeated. What an absolute relief. But now we've just jumped out of the frying pan and into the fire, because it's now time to fight Dialga. And since Dawn won't let us leave, I can't teach Monkey close combat, so we don't have a reliable way to one-shot it. This is terrifying, since Roar of Time can one-shot Monkey and Cow. Fortunately, Dialga is a wild Pokemon, and wild Pokemon use moves randomly, so if it doesn't use Roar of Time, we might be able to stand a chance. So, we slowly approach Dialga, and prepare for a terrifying battle with the God of Time. From here, it's a straight shot to Volkner. Although, we do run into this sorry excuse for a Fire-type trainer. Seriously, Flint? A Lopunny? A Driftblim? A Steelix? You make me sick. Experience management is absolutely terrifying here, because we do get really close to overleveling as a result of all the mandatory battles in Volkner's gym. But it works out, and once we get to Volkner, a Swords Dance from Monkey, followed by four close combats, is enough to kill all of Volkner's 
electric types. Also, we were holding a Cherry Berry in case Static activated on Raichu, so this battle was literally unlosable. With that, our next stop is the Elite Four. So after clearing through Victory Road, destroying Rival Rival one last time, and getting to the level cap, and also doing hours of preparation, we're ready to take on the Elite Four with a monkey and a cow. Here's our final team. Let's see if we've got what it takes. There's a few Elite Four members that will require some pretty risky strategies, and I'll make sure to explain them before we try them each time. But Aaron, the bug type Elite Four member, is not one of those people. I start the battle with Monkey in Blaze range so that his fire type attacks are boosted. I also give him a choice specs, and then flamethrowers incinerate every single one of Aaron's team members, even the Drapian in the back. And that's an easy first victory. So next up is Bertha. But the strategy for Bertha is almost completely foolproof. She leads with a Quagsire. Here's its moveset. If you notice, her only damaging move is Dig. So by teaching Protect to Monkey, I can avoid any damage from Quagsire other than Sandstorm Chip. This allows me to safely set up the two Calm Minds necessary for Grass Knots to sweep through Bertha's entire team. The one problem is that Quagsire could spam Double Team, and with incredibly terrible luck, I could miss enough Grass Knots that Sandstorm Chip takes me out or I run out of PP, but that would be insanely unlucky. Like less than 1% chance of happening. No one is that unlucky. So Bertha leads Quagsire, and I start setting up Calm Minds. And Bertha just throws the game by making the stupefying decision to go for double protects as I set up Calm Minds. So the Grass Knot hits on the next turn, and then Grass Knot sweeps through the rest of Bertha's team. Well, almost. Pseudo Wudo is last, and it hangs on to Grass Knot. I completely forgot that Sandstorm buffs the special defense of rock types. That's a mistake on my part, but fortunately it's an okay one to make here, because Pseudo Wudo doesn't know a ground type move, so even with a crit, I would have been fine since I have a Citrus Berry on Monkey, so that would even prevent the Sandstorm Chip from taking me out. Anyways, it was a little sloppy, but that's Bertha defeated. Next is the fake fire type trainer Flint, and this is actually a bit tricky. We need to set up a sword stance with Monkey, but the Rapidash knows Bounce, so if it uses Bounce and it either crits or paralyzes me, I'm actually in a bit of trouble. Unfortunately, I can't hold a Cherry Berry or a Koba Berry for either of those two scenarios, because we need a Colber Berry so that we're able to take care of the Drift Blim in the back. So I teach Monkey Dig. That way, if the Rapidash uses Bounce on the first turn, I can use Dig on the second turn to avoid it. Unfortunately, because the DP AI is so dumb and unpredictable, that's not really guaranteed. It could also just go for a Flare Blitz. And if that Flare Blitz crits, then I'm in trouble because Flint's Infernape knows Mach Punch which is priority, and it could then kill me with a priority Mach Punch if that Mach Punch crits. So this is kind of a risky battle. On the first turn, I go for a Swords Dance, and I pray for anything but Flare Blitz. But that is what the DP AI decides to do. So that sucks. Fortunately, it's not a crit, so it's not the end of the world. I can't use Dig here though, because if Rapidash uses Bounce, then I lose. So I have to go for Close Combat, which lowers my defense and special defense by one stage. Fortunately, with the HP that I'm at, a Mach Punch from Infernape won't kill me, even with the defense drop, even if it crits. And Infernape should be coming out next, because it's the only one of Flint's Pokémon that has a super effective move into Monkey. But for some reason, Lopunny comes out. Presumably because it knows Mirror Coat, which is coded as a Psychic-type attack, and the AI reads that as super effective against Monkey. That's dumb. And unfortunately, this Lopunny is surprisingly bulky, so a dig won't kill it so I have to use Close Combat to knock it out, which again lowers my defenses. This means that Mach Punch from Infernape will now kill if it crits. So, the Infernape comes out, and on the next turn it goes for Mach Punch. But thankfully it doesn't crit, and we're able to retaliate with a Close Combat of our own, knocking it out. Next is Celix, which goes down to a Close Combat, and then last is the Drift Blim, who goes down to the Cobra Berry boosted Natural Gift. Flint and his fake Fire types are defeated. The last Elite Four member is Lucian, and now here's where things get tricky. Lucian leads Mr. Mime. Sometimes, it'll just try and set up screens. We need to set up a Swords Dance with Monkey to successfully knock everything else out in the back. Shadow Claw will take care of the Mr. Mime, the Alakazam, and the Medicham. And Close Combat will take care of the Girafferig and the Bronzong. But if Mr. Mime sets up a Reflect, then we need to set up two Swords Dances and stall out the Reflect with a few Protects before the Bronzong comes in. But unfortunately, the Mr. Mime might not go for screens. It might just go for a Psychic. In that case, we need to be able to survive a Psychic. 
We can actually change the EVs that Monkey has by using some EV berries and some vitamins to take Monkey's defense EVs and put them into special defense. This will make it so that Mr. Mime can never one-shot Monkey with Psychic so long as it doesn't crit. We can also play around the crit by giving Monkey a Pyapa Berry to reduce the damage of a Psychic-type move, which makes this a guaranteed win. But, because of Monkey's pesky attack IV of 2, plus 2 close combat doesn't always kill the Bronzong. It actually has an 87.5% chance to one-shot, and if it doesn't one-shot, the Bronzong will likely retaliate with a Psychic or an Earthquake for the kill. I can guarantee a kill on the Bronzong with a Fist Plate to boost Monkey's Fighting-type moves, but then we're at risk to a crit from Mr. Mime. Ultimately, I choose to go with the Fist Plate, since 6.25% chance of a crit is lower than 12.5% chance of missing the kill with close combat. Either way, there's a chance we lose the run here. So Lucian leads Mr. Mime, and we set up a Swords Dance, and then Mr. Mime sets up a Light Screen. Literally the best case scenario. So from here, Monkey sweeps through the rest of Lucian's team, taking no damage. Thank you crappy DP AI. With that, we've beaten the Elite Four, and I am feeling great. The final obstacle of the challenge is Cynthia. She's tough for sure, but she's significantly easier in Diamond and Pearl than she is in Platinum. And I actually have a really great strategy planned out for this. Thanks to the fact that Monkey single-handedly took care of the Elite Four on his own, he's gained a bunch of levels, which means that he can outspeed the Garchomp. So, with a Pomag Berry equipped, we can make Natural Gift a 70 base power Ice-type move. At plus 2 attack, that will one-shot the Garchomp. A plus 2 close combat will also kill Cynthia's Gastrodon, Milotic, and Lucario. And a plus 2 Earthquake will kill the Roserade. So that just leaves the Spiritomb, which knows Psychic. We can tweak Monkey's EVs a little bit here by dropping our attack down from 252 EVs to 100 EVs with the use of a single Kelpsy Berry. Then we can use the leftover EVs to give us some more HP and some more special defense EVs so that Psychic will never kill Monkey, even if it crits. Unfortunately, a plus 2 Earthquake won't kill the Spiritomb from full health, so if Spiritomb gets a crit with either Psychic, then it's game over. The way around this is to bring Cow off the bench. By leading Cow, we can do enough damage to Spiritomb with Solar Beam to guarantee a kill with an Earthquake from Monkey. I've decided to use Solar Beam because even if the Solar Beam crits, it won't kill Spiritomb. After that though, it means that we need to sacrifice Cow to get a free switch into Monkey. But Cow's sacrifice will give us a guaranteed win. So, we prep Cow for the slaughter, and we give him a heart scale to show just how much we love him. And then we step into Cynthia's chambers. The music starts, and our battle begins. She leads Spiritomb, and Cow starts with the Solar Beam. Spiritomb goes for a Dark Pulse, and then Cow hits her with Solar Beam, doing the damage needed for Monkey to get the kill with a plus two Earthquake. But then Spiritomb goes for a Silver Wind, and she gets the Omni Boost. This sucks because it means that Earthquake won't kill from this range. It also means that a critical hit from Spiritomb will now kill Monkey. So suddenly, victory is no longer guaranteed. But it's still really heavily in our favor. We need to go for a Flamethrower to get a little more damage on Spiritomb, but if it burns or crits, then we're in trouble because Spiritomb will faint or it'll just heal. Luckily, the Flamethrower does neither, and Spiritomb goes for a Dark Pulse, leaving Cow with 4 HP. On the next turn, I use a Sunny Day so as not to damage the Spirit Doom anymore, and Cow goes down to a Silver Wind. While this Silver Wind doesn't trigger another Omni Boost, it does get a crit, so this Spirit Tomb is kind of on fire. Thank you for your sacrifice, Cow, but you've now set up Monkey for the victory. All we need to do is dodge one more crit as we set up a Sword Stance. I'm at a loss for words. Even as I write this script, rewatching the gameplay, it's unbelievable. Really just terrible, terrible luck. The chances of losing this battle this way are 10% for the Omni Boost from Silverwind, times 6.25% for the critical hit, for a nice healthy 0.625% chance. That's pretty soul crushing. But admittedly, 0.625% is a little misleading, because it is ignoring all the chances that this run could have wiped well ahead of time. I could have missed rock slides against Cyrus, I could have been crit by Crasher Wake, Fantina, Candice, Mars and Jupiter, or any number of other random trainer battles that I didn't show where I was accidentally playing suboptimally. 
The fact of the matter is that in a run like this, where you can't have a single death, every battle matters, and the tiny chances here and there will all eventually add up. So it's honestly surprising that I was even able to make it as far as I did. Does that make it feel any better to wipe to the champion? No. 0.625% chance is still really low, but I am incredibly proud of myself for getting to this point. And this challenge was so much fun. I've never had to use so many fringe strategies, and I've never felt more excited than when I was able to finally crack a strategy that I thought was impossible. That being said, this still really sucks, and I'm definitely not going to be retrying this challenge anytime soon. I think I've proven that the challenge is possible. In fact, we can try it one more time after the wipe, just to see what would happen. And hilariously, on this second attempt, the Spiritomb still does get an Omni Boost off. Actually, it gets two Omni Boosts off. I have no idea what Cynthia is feeding her Spiritomb, but sign me up for whatever it is. Despite the two Omni Boosts, though, on this next attempt, the Spiritomb doesn't get the critical hit with Psychic, and we're able to sweep through Cynthia's team exactly as expected. So, can a hardcore Nuzlocke of Diamond with fire types only be completed? Yes. Can I complete a hardcore Nuzlocke of Diamond with fire types only? No. At least not at this time. And somehow, I'll have to be okay with that. But Nuzlocke's are failed all the time, even by the best Nuzlockers. So, that's Pokemon for you. I'm sure I'll attempt this again someday, but for now, it's time to move on to another challenge. As an educational point, let's just look at one last thing before we go. A user in my Twitch chat pointed out that had Cow known Captivate instead of Sunny Day, I would have won this battle. Captivate is a move that lowers the special attack of a Pokemon of the opposite gender by two stages. Had I done this instead of use Sunny Day on this third turn here, then the Spirit Tomb would be at minus one special attack, and a critical hit would result in neutral damage, never resulting in a kill on Monkey. Of course, this strategy isn't flawless either, because it does require Cow to survive a follow-up attack from the Spirit Tomb, which isn't always guaranteed. And we can't go for Captivate before Flamethrower, because that additional damage is still needed on Monkey to make sure that we can get the kill with Earthquake. So, while Captivate still doesn't always guarantee a win, it would have been a good contingency plan for me to have. But again, playing around that 0.625% chance isn't always easy to remember to do especially since using a Bug-type move against my Fire-type Pokémon seems like something that the AI shouldn't and wouldn't do. Regardless, lesson learned, and I'm a better Nuzlocker for it. Anyways, thank you all so much for watching this video and for all your continued support. If you enjoyed watching, please like the video and subscribe for more challenges just like this. Be sure to follow me on Twitter and Twitch to keep up with streams of my future challenges, and you can now join the Flygon HG Community Discord server. We'd love to have you there, so come and join the conversation. Until then, remember to always, 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 always play around the critical hit.